Ned, I like to say Ned has wilderness in his blood. Um, he's been working in the wilderness for so many years. He has been a wilderness skills instructor, uh, wilderness EMT. He's worked for the US Forest Service as a wilderness ranger, um, worked with the National Ski Patrol. So he has so much experience specifically in the Sierra with the snow. Um, and he is also through hike the PCT, the JMT many times and um, half of the CDT. And um, it's just such a treat to have Ned on. And I know, like I said before, I hiked the PCT and I could have really used all of this information that you're gonna hear um, before I started my trek. So um, I hope you guys enjoy. And with that, Ned, take it away. All right, very good. Everybody can hear me, I assume. Uh, maybe thumbs up or something like that. Very good, all right, I'm getting through. Um, I appreciate what Carol's doing. Uh, Normally, you know, you've only got so many sources um, for reliable information. And when it comes down to uh, the dangers of something, I, I don't see a whole lot posted. People get all excited about certain things and they blow it out of the water. And you, then you question, well, was it real or not? Um, I have, as Carol said, I've been teaching in the Sierra on the John Muir Trail PCT above 10,000 feet for at least two months of every year in the last 40. Uh, I've seen a lot of drought winters. I've seen a lot of heavy winters. Um, I know what the Sierra can do because I've lived in it um, for those two months as well as uh, between January and May, we ran weekend trainings and week-long trainings in the Tahoe area, sometimes up in the Stevens Pass in Washington, sometimes uh, west of Bend and the Sisters, uh, you know, over the years. So I've got a pretty good handle of different types of snow, different kinds of conditions, what things look like in different months. And so when um, Carol and I, I think Carol and I were talking about this and it became apparent to me that you guys needed to realize that if you start in a particular month, you're gonna have different conditions than uh, the person who starts the next month or even two weeks different from you. Now, tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna paint the picture of why starting in March is you know, good, uh, maybe it's bad. It depends upon you. So after I get done, laying all of this out and I'm going to try and cram it all in in an hour because if you know me at all uh, I have a, a, a sort of unstructured way of teaching um, but tonight because there's so much information I want to try and be as structured as possible so with that in mind I do have a list of things believe it or not I have an outline my god that's a big step for me but um, I'm going to try and stick to that. And so after the first hour, then we'll get into stuff, uh, maybe a little more free form. I'm going to try and kick it all out and then we can talk about it later. So Carol did say that uh, I've done a number of things uh, in my life to bring the subject matter to you guys, whether it was taking classes at UC Davis in, in biology and geology and atmospheric sciences and blah, 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 to, in order to uh, to, to, to be able to share it with you guys so you're better equipped. When you're better equipped, you're going to be more empowered to be able to protect yourself and yet be at peace so you can relax and enjoy where you're at. For me, at least, that's why I go into the mountains. I'm going there uh, not so much to escape something at, you know, at home or in society. I've got to get away, panic. I'm going for a bit of fresh air, a bit of free time. And in your case, it's going to be a five and a half month free time. <laughs> but anyway, so you need to know what you're going to be facing. And I hope to bring a lot of insight to what you're going to be facing, what I call the realities of the trail. So we may be uh, uh, talking a lot of snow, but I'll also be putting it in context to the sort of stuff that you're going to have to do in a day, in a morning the kind of decisions you're gonna to need to make for that day or for the next two weeks while you're winging it on the trail because you just realized the conditions aren't what you expected. So you have to retool. So when we talk about the pros and cons and, I, and coming up, I'm going to address this from the point of view of 
uh, log logistical differences, strategic differences, and simply weather differences between the, the different months or even maybe two weeks apart in two week increments. What is gonna be different between starting March 1st and March 14th or March 14th and the 1st of April, for example, in those three areas, weather, logistics, strategy. Um, as Carol may have pointed out, the reason for doing this isn't just you know, to inform you guys, yeah, that's great, but it's to make you more aware of a safety concern. I'm not trying to be a fear monger. Those terms kind of get blown around a little bit. It's simply to open your eyes to what's really out there. I don't want you leaving Kennedy Meadows South and going up to Elantra in, in Cottonwood and being blown out of the water because you weren't prepared for what you're seeing. I want you to be prepared so you can realize, oh, no, maybe I do need to take uh, uh, hiking crampons in a whippet. Maybe I, maybe, maybe I don't after a drought winter. See, some of these things are gonna change depending upon the winter. So it's all about trying to figure out when the best time to start. If you've already got your permit, you're kind of locked in. So if you uh, are also a, a John Muir Trail hiker, say you're not doing the PCT, but you're interested and you're attending tonight because you're gonna do the JMT this summer, or maybe you wanna do it in May, You've attending, you're attending the right time slot because the March start, uh, people who start the PCT in March are gonna enter this year in May. So if you're gonna enter this year in May on the JMT, which of course is a subset of the PCT, um, keep listening. All right, so now you know why, why we're doing this, why we're gonna, um, I, why I'm gonna address certain points. Big picture, Southern California takes about four to six weeks to get to Kennedy Meadows. The Sierras takes about four weeks to get to Sonora Pass or roughly Tahoe. So now you're two and a half months in. Northern California takes about a month. Oregon takes about a month. Washington takes about a month. Depends upon how fast you go, obviously. So this is kind of targeted at uh, starting about mid-March and ending about mid-September. And of course, now you're going like, okay, that's six months or whatever the heck it is. It's too round of a figure. So, but anyway, you're in a good place for starting now because, and I know I'm a little biased, but I've been up there for too many years to steer you wrong. Even if I say, you've got to do it a certain way. I want you guys to think about it consider it, ask around, make your own decisions, test it, go out there and find out if, God, was Ned blowing smoke or is that true? You have to decide if what I am saying sounds right for you. Something that I like to say, does it work for you? This is your trip. This is your journey. And this trip is going to change your life. I know you've heard it. It's not hyperbole. You're going you're gonna to end a different person than you started. And a lot of that will have a bearing, will, will um, be caused by your preparation, how, how at peace you are, how ready you are for things, rather than just winging it. Now, some people can do that just fine. They're really great at winging it, multitasking and all that. But when you're two days away from the trailhead and the, the road to the trailhead is closed, and you've got a 25 mile walk down 8,000 feet on asphalt, just because your shoes were the wrong kind to go into the Sierra, you're gonna be really in a bad way. So the more prepared you are, the more at peace you'll be, the more aware you'll be, and the safer you'll be. That worked out pretty good, so I'll stick with that. Okay, so the main variables to the pros and cons has to do with the time of season which we're gonna address in the weather area. The intensity of the preceding winter. If the preceding winter is a drought winter, you're gonna have different conditions you're gonna be seeing out there. If it's a normal winter, well, what the hell is normal? You know, uh, I can get into that, but I'm not going to write at the moment. Or if it's a heavy winter. Heavy winter, uh, statistically speaking, is anything over 500 inches of directly measured snowfall in the, at least the Tahoe area. 
Now, remember, and if you've been following some of the things that I've been writing just lately, 500 inches of total accumulation does not mean you're going to go outside and see 500 inches. You're going to see probably within the next 48 hours after that total is, is dumped, you're going to probably see about half that, depending upon air temperature, amounts of sunlight, amount of wind, humidity, et cetera. They all have a bearing on the snowpack. Why not? Let's get into that. Um, departing slightly, but very important. Remember, you're not walking on dirt. Okay, Ned, duh, got it. There's no traction. There's very little traction. You're walking on frozen water, snow, right? Frozen water. If it's in the powder form, it's very soft and fluffy and it doesn't hold your weight. But if it, once it settles and consolidates, goes from that 500 inches to maybe 300 inches, and refreezes at night. Now, these are very important points. It has to refreeze at night. Melt, which is to thaw, refreezes at night, solidifies, settles, becomes one big mass by the time you get there, May 1st. Depending upon what the weather does, watch your temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm getting at here is it's a snowpack is composed of layers. Every storm dumps so many feet, so many inches, whatever. Then the sun comes out, melts the surface, it refreezes at night because it's still winter. And then you've got like this crusty surface and a, and a powdery underlayer to a degree. And the more it can consolidate, the less powder, and the more that becomes one frozen unit, not like ice, it's just frozen snow. New snow falls on this crusty, icy layer, couple feet. And you, if it's flat, if, if it's falling on flat surface, you get a couple feet of powder on an old surface. Now, if you tilt that surface up at an angle, that new snow is going to want to slide down the ski run. So this is why it's so important that the snow be consolidated because then it doesn't go anywhere then you don't have to worry about avalanches and things. There are some things to worry about, and we'll talk about that a little bit tonight and how to solve that problem tomorrow. But I wanna get it in your head that when you're walking on snow, you're walking on a whole bunch of different layers of, of uh, different thicknesses of snow with ice layers in there, and you could have um, a high wind event happen and it breaks branches off of trees nearby, so you've got tree branches in the snow, you've got boulders and rocks in the snow, some tree could have blown over, maybe an avalanche happened and you got all kinds of stuff and debris in the, in the snow. So when you post hole in come June, your feet aren't just, your legs aren't just penetrating through soft snow. Your legs may be sliding alongside a granite boulder, a, a fallen tree trunk, past all kinds of tree branches. So your legs get cut up or can get cut up. The point here now still being the snow pack, which is the whole thing, is comprised of layers. All right. So I want to tell you that this whole thing I'm going to present can be looked at from the point of view of the, it being a practical idea, a functional idea, and a realistic one. Now, practical to me is it means that it's easy. It's practical. It's easy to do. Okay, I'm going to start sometime in March. I'm going to do four to six weeks through Southern California. I'll get into the details of that in a minute. Pretty simple. Swinging my feet on dry trail with the exception of some places in Southern California where the trail goes up in elevation. If it goes above six, 8,000 feet, you should anticipate snow. But, you know, do your research beforehand, depending upon how much snow is hit. I happen to be right now in Southern California. How much snow has hit here? We had snow this December. Um, maybe it did melt off be between now and when you, when you get there. So you've got to kind of keep an eye on that stuff, even as you're hiking. Check your weather reports. Talk to your friends. Ask your family to, to research what's going on on Mount San Jacinto. How's uh, Mount Baldy doing? Uh, anybody uh, at, the, at the, um, the hardware store in Wrightwood, are they able to give you uh, advice on trail conditions? other stuff like that, but do that while you're on the trail. It's functional, this idea that I'm gonna present, because believe it or not, it works. 
Uh, it used to be that way back when, see, I did the PCT back in 1974. Um, uh, I didn't see another hiker. Oh, no, wait a minute, I did. I saw one other PCT through hiker the entire five and a half months I was out there. Um, I didn't really have a trail in Southern California or Northern California. And, and uh, yet I had a trail, a great one in Oregon and Washington. But what I'm getting at is that we used to think back then, well, I'll start anytime. I don't know any better. I don't know anybody who's done it. I haven't read a book by anybody who's done it until about 1970 when Eric Ryback published his book about hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, which was an idea at the time. It was an idea when I did it. Matter of fact, the National Forest didn't have a map of the trail. I'd ask them as a kid, I was 15 and 16 planning my hike and I asked them, where's the trail go? You've sent me your map. You know, those huge gigantic maps the Forest Service each have. And they, they couldn't tell me where it's gonna go except for they had read somewhere, maybe it's gonna go by this peak and past that lake and whatever. So you had to map it out yourself. But over time, because I started in March and a lot of people did, initially it was accepted and then tossed out. And people thought, I don't wanna walk on snow for months. If you start early, I'm gonna walk on snow for months. They didn't realize that the snow turns to concrete and that's why the, the Oregonians call it cascade cement. You know, it does, it gets very hard. And especially once people put a boot track in the snow and they pack it down and it refreezes and it gets hard. It's not hard to walk on, but it is hard to walk through when it starts melting. So it's an easy, it's an easy idea. Start early and it's functional. It works. People have been doing it for years. I think almost 50 <laughs> and it works. It, it's true. It's valid. I can give you lots of the names of people who have done it. But anyway, let's get into this thing. So the highlights of the pros and cons in general. If you start in March, it's gonna be cooler, it's gonna be wetter, and it could actually have uh, some rainstorms in Southern California, amazingly enough, it does rain down here. Um, and it might, uh, you might get a little snow. Now chances are in March and April, Southern California is not gonna have a big dump. So if you get snow, it might be in the inches variety and probably less in the foot variety. It will, Consolidate quickly because usually in the spring, if you get a snow dump, the sun comes out right after. What happens? Warms the snow, it settles, and it refreezes at night, which is consolidation. Within a day or two after a big powder snowstorm, you should be able to get out and walk on the surface and not sink in. If you heard what I just said, if you get caught in a powder storm that dumps a foot or more, you might be waiting a day before trying to kick through it. If you wait a day, it can consolidate and then you can walk on top of it. It's a hell of a lot easier and it consumes less energy than trying to wallow through it. And you, you, you don't get the wet and cold that you would if you were wallowing through it. If you start early, you'll have more time to get to Canada before first snow. Now, first snows is an expression but it's very valid. Anytime after the middle of September and certainly by October 1st, over the history that I've been watching it, which is almost 50 years and attested to by the Rangers in Manning Provincial Park, you better get the heck off the trail by mid-September because when the storms come in, in the North uh, Pacific Northwest, North Cascades, they usually do so with a vengeance. You'll have a little forewarning. Uh, it's gonna get a lot colder a couple of weeks before it starts snowing, uh, humidity is going to go up. Remember, you're right next to a big ocean. So the snow is wetter than, say, in Colorado. What does that have a bearing upon? If it starts dumping on you in northern Washington, it might be exceedingly wet and cold, more so than if you were trying to kick through the snow in Colorado. Colorado will be cold, but it won't be as wet. Um, we'll get into shoes and footwear and gaiters and clothing and all that stuff later. But let me just, I'll, I'll continue on here. I'm, I'm tempted, I bring that up because I'm tempted to get into some of that stuff, but um, best if I don't. So you'll have more time to do more things. Most PCT through hikers, it's all about the miles. It's all about the weight. It's all about go, go, go. And not all of us are out there for that reason. 
So if you start earlier, it was all always, you know, kind of poo-pooed because, oh my God, you're going to have to deal with wet and cold, Southern California mm -hmm. snow, it's going to be miserable, you're going to have mud, yeah, you know, maybe down here the, the resupply locations aren't closed, but once you get further north, and I'll be talking about that, you might have that uh, as a problem. But if you want to, as I've, I, I, I teach on the trail, or I used to teach on the trail, right, right now I'm working for Homeland Security, uh, FEMA, doing disaster recovery work, helping cities and counties and states get grant monies to rebuild. So that's what I do right at the moment of the last four years. But I've been out there long enough to see plenty of PCT through hikers blow by me in the vicinity of Mount Whitney and Forrester. And all they're thinking about is the next hamburger, the next pizza, the next uh, town visit. And they're not really enjoying themselves. And I'll, I'll hang out with some of them and they'll go like, oh my God, I got to find a different group to go with because these guys are just go, 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 going too fast. And I'm not out here for that. I want to enjoy myself. I want to, you know, later in the summer, for example, people do other things like they go fishing, they go swimming, they climb trees, they, they explore a meadow, uh, they maybe go up a peak. Take time to do that. This is your one shot. A lot of through hikers do the whole darn thing. And then they'll tell you, Oh man, I like that area so so not so much. I want to go back. Now, yeah, you can do that even if you're going 15, 17 miles a day, sure. But if you're cranking out your 20s and 30s and more, you're not really going to be able to see as much and do as much other than hiking. So you decide. Hopefully you have by now. Am I the kind, am I out here to hike or am I out here to, to enjoy myself? Maybe be more of a camper, maybe have breakfast in bed and dinner in bed and watch the sun go down. You could do that on 17 miles a day, which was my average, you know, but to each their own. So you decide what you want to do. Do I want to get up before the sunrise every day, walk all day, maybe not take my pack off? Hard for me to imagine. And then walk into the dark after sunset and put your tent up in the dark on God knows what number of pine cones and branches and things. And maybe, yeah, you got a headlight and so forth, but I'm exaggerating. But anyway, you know why you're out there. So if you start early, you've got more time, you can go slow. There's fewer bugs. There's fewer bears. There's less dirt to get all over you. There's fewer people. There's fewer rangers. There's less chance of wildfires. Go early. You have less chance of avalanches. And the main highlight of the discussion for your group, for the starts, starters of March, is are you going to be able to utilize the advantages of the secret season in the Sierra? The secret season is May 1st to June 1st, where you have very little snowfall, very few avalanches, consolidated snow to walk on. It's like a big sidewalk. Yeah, it might be tilted in some places and steep and awkward and but the creeks are frozen over. See, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So there are advantages of this month time period, and we'll get into that. It does require a little more training. You do have to be a little bit more aware of the hazards out there, thus this discussion tonight. You do have to bring a little bit more food, especially in the snow, because you don't know if you're gonna have a snow dump hit you, and you might have to spend a day or two or three in your tent. Um, certainly it's colder, so you're going to have to think about more clothing, more gear, maybe a little more preparation, that kind of stuff. But you know what? It's not that hard, and that's why we're talking about what we're talking about. So that is sort of the lead-in to what we're going to what can I cover now. The pros, the advantages of starting in March. This is the subsection of weather. I'm kind of going to go through it like I'm reading it, but I'm not going to bore you or do like a... Uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm just not about that. So I'll try not to get on tangents, but I got to get it out there and then we can dive back in later. So as far as weather, your advantages are it's cooler, maybe a little wetter, but it's a hell of a lot better than baking in 110 degrees or more sun, which would be your uh, late April, May starts from Campo. You're starting now in March. So it's a lot more hospitable cooler, maybe a little rain, not bad. Your canteens may still freeze. Think about that. Your water filters may freeze and break overnight, even down here. So pay attention to what the overnight temperatures are doing. So that stuff doesn't happen to you. So less hot sun, 
better temperatures, um, let's see, you'll have more water. The creeks are gonna be a little bit higher. Now the creeks down here usually aren't all that big, but it's nice to be able to have a, a greater frequency of natural water and rely less upon the kindness of other people who, who drive water out to water caches along the trail. Try not to depend on them. You never know who's gonna need them. And if you don't necessarily need to be carrying, uh, getting water from a catch, don't. But by starting early, you also don't have to carry as much because it's cooler. You're not sweating as much, etc. Once you get to the Sierra, the nice thing in May is you have less of a chance of fresh snowfall. You don't really wanna be dealing with powder snow because you can't, it won't support your weight. So you're gonna be going through it rather than walking on it. So that's a really good thing. You get up there in May, it's consolidated, it's killer. It's like a big sidewalk, like I said. Further on north where wildfires have always been a problem, you start early, you'll be going through Tahoe in around June 1st. Yeah, you can get a wildfire, especially if you've had a drought winter. And if this one turns into another drought winter, winter which I doubt, um, yeah, you probably could, but you'll, they'll be less likely. So you're going to have better air conditions, better visibility by getting through these areas early. Also, Northern California is very well known for very hot temperatures. Hat Creek Rim, very exposed, very hot. Um, if you get up there, you'll be up there. But if you're starting in March, you'll be up there in um, June. Middle of June, latter, yeah, about middle of June. Um, you're going to find that you're still going to have, if this is a normal to a heavy winter, even in the middle of June in Northern California, you may have snow on the ridges and on the northern aspects of them. Northern aspects meaning what aspect of the hill points to the north. So those aspects, of those slopes that face to the north are in the shade they may hold their snow longer. This is true in the Sierra, this is true everywhere. If you're looking at Forester Pass from the south and you go, oh my God, there's no snow, How fantastic. You get at the top and you're on top of four or five feet of snow. That's normal. So by starting early, you've got a really good weather window. Chance of snow in the Sierra, chance of snow in Southern California, cooler weather in Northern California, Oregon in July, Washington in August, depending upon your speed, those are all good months to be there. Logistics, once again, we're in the pros, advantages of doing the, starting the PCT in March. Logistically, we've already nailed this one, you can go slower. You can also utilize that consolidated snow for a little boot skiing, a little boot skating. You will learn how to go downhill on the balls of your feet, now, not the heels of your feet, but the balls of your feet. As you rock forward on the balls of your feet, you lift your heel off of the snow and your feet turn into skis. Yes, you can quite easily parallel ski if you're good at it. You can edge with your shoes if you've got a little bit of edge and you break by rocking back onto your heels and using the vertical face of your heel, it's very important, Mono soles that are one piece don't have vertically faced heels. Those are your brakes. Those are the bulldozer blade that you're going to be needing to suddenly stop if you see a boulder coming up real quick and, or you, you know, you need to stop real quick. I'll get into all those techniques uh, at another meeting. But anyway, you can go slower. You can utilize the snow for glissading, boot skiing, boot skating. Glissading is killer. You can drop several thousand feet off of Forrester. Mm, a couple minutes, maybe a minute and a half. It's a whole nother experience. If you like roller coasters, you're going to be having a ball going down these things. And off of Forrester, if you know where they are, there's five different glissades to where you get to the bottom. And each one is hundreds of yards long. And they're wonderful, glorious, incredible. Logistically, yeah, you're going to need a little more gear. Sorry to say it, but you're going to need some specialized stuff and realize that because you happen to have an ice axe and maybe uh, um, ice axe and micro spikes, it does not mean you're safe. Gear, having the right gear does not necessarily mean that you're gonna be safe. Knowing what to do it with it helps, but just carrying it, like you're gonna see a lot of uh, hikers with the ice axe on the back of their pack. 
and I watch them go up Forrester. They're not part of my class, so they go right on by. I'm teaching people how to do it safely, and they blow on they by. Think it's just fine, and next thing I know, I see the guy tumbling down the hill with his ice axe on the back of his pack. What good did it do? He didn't identify the risk going into the slope to stop, get a plan, take the ice axe off, utilize it on the traverses, because it's nothing but switchbacks going on up. And it really doesn't matter much if you're going up or down. You need to have a self-arrest device in hand for it to do you any good. Therefore, a self-arrest pole is always in your hand. I don't know when I'm going to go down. I, I haven't fallen in, in a long time, except for demonstrating. But you never really know. A slip is a slip. A post hole suddenly, unexpectedly, can throw your head downhill on a traverse, you lose your balance and that's all it takes. It takes something unforeseen. So you try and anticipate that. So more gear, more clothing, we hit on that, more food. Another advantage of logistically is that if you do start without the right stuff, you got a little more time to step off trail and get the right stuff or to kill some time in some place. Like you get to Kennedy Meadows South, and say Yogi doesn't have something in her store, so you've got to hitch to Lone Pine and get it quickly. Burns time, burns money, uh, but you'll have time. And that's an advantage. Also, we're, we're looking at if you're starting around March 1st, I don't want you guys to be hitting the Sierra till May 1st. Due to those avalanche conditions and the, uh, and the, um, um, the dominance of more powder in April. Remember, the ski areas don't close until Easter which is what, the latter part of April? So they themselves deem, hey, you know, there's less interest, people uh, aren't that interested in skiing. Yeah, we got some good snow, but it's starting to consolidate. People love powder skiing. They're not that interested. Now they're thinking about water skiing. So um, when the ski area starts shutting down, then you know, hey, it might be getting close to the time when I can safely get in the Sierra and not have to worry about powder snow, uh, avalanches, Cornices dropping. I'll get into all this junk, but it's easier to to both um, uh, to, to move around on the snow. Now, third section on the pros is strategy. What is the advantage strategically for starting early? When it comes to the Sierra, we've already talked a lot and a little bit in Southern California, but because of the secret season window, because of the fact that you want to be on consolidated, settled glued down frozen tight snow, that's a strategic advantage. You're not going to get it once the thaw starts. So let's talk about that too. You're not going to have, you may have a bit of a thaw down here in Southern California because we get, we get all kinds of different high desert winds that create warmer, uh, warmer currents that, that affect the snow. If the snow starts thawing out down here, it doesn't mean it's thawing in, in the Sierra because of that. This is high desert realm, really. Sort of like um, off the east side of the Sierra, you've got Reno and Vegas out there in Nevada, high desert, lots of heat rising. On the west side of the Sierra, you've got the San Joaquin Valley, huge gigan gigantic valley with lots of heat being created that's rising up the, the peaks uh, on both sides of the Sierra, creating all those clouds and things that you're gonna see. So you've got issues with topography and uh, heat generating um, uh, uh, places like high deserts that will affect the type of snow that you're going to encounter. If you're uh, hiking through Southern California in March and April and you hear on the radio or from somebody ahead uh, that uh, the thaw has already started, the creeks are already rising. I mean, you could have that if we have a drought winter. So that when you get there May, May 1st, it's gonna look like July. And that's what happens after a series of drought winters. I don't wanna to get too far ahead on that. Another advantage of the secret season is that the creeks are frozen over. The thaw hasn't started. So you have bridges over everything. You don't see the creeks. You don't hear the creeks because there's no big water flow to make any noise. Whereas come the thaw, you'll hear a creek roaring below you a mile and a half away and down uh, at least 1500 feet and it's just roaring and you're thinking oh my god it's going to be nothing but white water torrent like something out of lord of the rings you know and 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 when you get down there it is pretty impressive but you're not going to have that 
You go in in May, it's all frozen sidewalk. You don't even have sun cups. Sun cups are these little depressions that turn into, turn into uh, sunken garbage cans over, over time in the thaw. And it's a big honeycomb pattern on the snow. So it's a bear to try and walk through these fields of sun cups where a slight slip and you're down the bottom of the hole. Now, earlier in the season, the holes aren't so deep, but they will get there. You don't really wanna be in the Sierra during the thaw. Nasty creeks, soft snow, sun cups that that'll, 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 you'll slide into. And yes, you can post hole in the bottom of the sun cup if you're out in the afternoon uh, after the thaw starts. When does the thaw start? You guys gotta get this down. Start looking for the thaw to start around um, June 1st. Now it's not cast in cement. So what you need to be doing is, is monitoring how cold it gets at night. Have some low reading recording thermometer or get up in the middle of the night and look at your little thermometer, your hang tag zipper thing and just see how cold it's getting. If it's beginning to get anywhere near 32, if it's getting up into the 28s, 29s, 30s over the course of your approach week, say from Kennedy Meadows South up to Cottonwood, Chicken Spring Lake, and it's getting close to 30, 31, you better hurry. It's only gonna stay below freezing uh, for five days, seven days, then it's gonna hit 32, 33, 34. And once it stops refreezing at night, the snow um, can't hold your body weight. And so you get up in the morning and you think you can start at seven or eight because you've been chilling and enjoying the hard, the hard surface of the, of the secret season. And now it's already an inch or two of soft snow on the surface. And then after an hour, it's uh, overtopping your shoe. And after two hours, you're already post to mid shin. That's how fast it goes. And by 10 in the morning, you can't go any further. And after a heavy winter where you've got five, six miles of approach, and then you got seven, eight miles of descent off the backside, you're gonna be on snow all day. So if you're out there and during the thaw, you're gonna be wallowing after a heavy winter. After a light winter, no. Okay, anyway, so these are the advantages that will help you with your strategy. You're starting early, very good strategic point. Navigation wise over snow, one of the beauties of the Sierra is you're largely above timberline. You're above 10,000 feet. Yeah, you dip down into the creeks and, and all that, I'll get into that in a minute, but your navigation is line of sight, beelining. You stand on top of one pass and you look for the next pass and you can see it. And you can see the creek in between where you've got to drop down below tree line and figure out where the hell to go. Because when you're down in the trees, you can't see the next pass. But this is so easy. It's easy to navigate when you can look at the whole thing for a two days walk, you can see in the future. And that's really easy. Also, when you're below tree line, you're not necessarily in dense forest like on the AT or something. You know, there's really no long green tunnel in the Sierra. Uh, maybe a little in Oregon, <laughs> maybe a little in Washington, but in the Sierra, over snow navigation is really simple. You've got to learn how to read a topo map, and we're we'll getting into that later. So strategically, it's a great time to be there. Another thing about uh, uh, being in the Sierra on snow is you can camp anywhere. I don't care if the snow is sloped. When you get to a place like you want to have a beautiful sunset dinner, and the ground is the snow is a little slope. You pound it flat with your feet and pitch your tent right there. It works perfect. If you don't have any water nearby, melt the snow, carry extra fuel for that. Or you planned this in advance. Hey, I want to camp on the pass. Why not? Oh, there's no water there in the summer. You're not there in the summer. Melt the snow. You can do so much more stuff on snow besides glissading and skiing on your boots and, and, and being able to camp anywhere and not deal with creeks and all that stuff. It's really great. We've already talked about the strategy of getting to Canada before first snows. It wasn't too many years ago that uh, we lost a cup. We lost one PCT through hiker and we had about 20 trapped by up to 12 feet of snow that descended on them in uh, so it was late September, it was right around September 25th, if I remember. Please get to Canada before first snows. Anytime after mid-September, it can start dumping. 
Wildfires we talked about as far as a strategy, if you start early, you, you don't have to deal with them. Pests we talked about already. Oh, and to, and to chime in, not only will there be fewer snakes because it's still cold in Southern California, there'll be fewer bugs and scorpions and things running around the ground because it's cold, but also you're gonna have fewer marmots and squirrels because it's not the big bears that are gonna be your pain later. It's gonna be the little bears. It's gonna be the squirrels. It's gonna be the marmots. They're gonna come up and chew on your boots just to get the salt while you stand still because they just came out of hibernation and they're looking for salt. And then I literally had this happen to me while I was on camera talking about something up in the high Sierra and the marmot came from behind me and started chewing on my shoes and the camera people thought it was hilarious. Scared the hell out of me. I didn't know what was going on. Medically, strategically, medically, early start is wonderful. You've technically got till May 1st to get to the snow. So you've got lots of time to start at five, eight, 10 miles a day. Listen to your tendons, muscles, joints, everything. They're gonna, there's no way to prepare for, for through hiking or backpacking, except for by backpacking itself. It uses specific muscle groups. You're not gonna get bicycling, swimming, jogging, et cetera. A little bit running stairs up and down because of the trauma involved and some of the muscle groups used, but a slow start, having lots of time in the beginning. California is rolling to a degree. Very good for your, your physical, getting your body up to speed. You also have less fears of hyperthermia, getting too hot. We had people uh, die down here in Southern California between Campo and Lake Morena. What a day one, first 20 miles. They got too hot and died. This stuff happens. It's not a joke and you'll have less fear of dehydration by starting early when it's cooler and wetter. Okay, that's it for the pros, the advantages. 